Hello everyone and welcome to Talking Business with me, Danny Pardo. On this episode, I'm talking business with Marvin. And you need to get yourself ready for this one because you are going to be inspired and motivated by Marvin's story of what he wanted to be when he was growing up to what he is right now, everything in between and what's coming next. A really great, honest talk here from Marvin. So without further ado, let's go. Let's talk business with Marvin. Hello everyone and welcome to Talking Business with me, Danny Pardo. On today's show, we are chatting to Marvin. Hello Marvin, how are you doing? Hello Danny, I'm good, thanks. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you very much. So we've had uh, a bit of a preamble before this one. We've had a phone chat beforehand as well, but I still feel like there's going to be a few things that I learn about you uh, as we go through today's today's uh, okay. recorded podcast chats so I, I suppose we better get started because i actually know a little bit about it. you're not too much but a bit but not many other people listening or watching might so uh should we ask that question who is marvin right there um great question and yeah strange one to, to answer who am i feels very philosophical but um i suppose i am a guy from south london with a background in law that's what i studied at university And then I'm one of those law students that decided I wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. (laughs) And um, I suppose in terms of going down that university route, it definitely stems from my upbringing. So um, I'm the oldest of uh, three kids. I've got younger sister, younger brother. So I always felt that responsibility to, you know, do well, um, lead the way, be be an example for younger siblings and um, coming from an African household as well. My mum being Nigerian, my dad being Congolese, it was, yeah, university. But I suppose as I got older, I realised there were so many other routes and that's probably part of the reason why eventually I became comfortable enough with myself and my skills and my experience to be like, actually, I, I can be more than a solicitor or a barrister or work in the legal sector. So. Um, I'm someone that in my free time, I like to play football, play futsal myself. Um, I'm also starting volunteering at a youth club because I'm passionate about youth. So I'm always trying to share any gems as I realise I'm not getting any younger. I'm getting I'm getting older that and it's so important. I'm afraid and you have really Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they don't see it coming. Like one day I was a kid, next day I was an adult. I don't know who did that to me, but I, I want to find them. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm just really enjoying now working full time and um, also tutoring as well. So uh, yeah, I'd say I'd say that's me. Like I've got an interest in technology and young people, and thank goodness I've been able to combine those two interests into my current role. Oh, that's awesome. I can't wait to get to your current role, but we're going to go back a little bit before we get there. So you said you were a law student who doesn't want to do law. So I'm trying to put all that together. So help uh, our viewers and listeners with this one. So let's go back to, say, 16, 17 years old. Is that when you are a, I'm studying law, I'm going to be a lawyer, this is my life now? Were were you in that mindset or was it just like, oh, I just think I'll do law? It was actually a bit earlier. So we have to go back one or two more years. And um, it was, so I was actually named after my dad's friend, who is called Marvin. <clears throat> and he is a solicitor so it was always Marvin like I suppose I kind of had that connection anyway but then growing up I realized I was someone that quite like debating and quite like public speaking and always wanted to help people like, I grew up in South London and I wanted to empower my community and others around me and I thought that law would be the best way to do that because I never really liked politics, um, which I thought would be the other avenue. And um, then what happened was the London riots. And I had my first work experience at a high street law firm in 2012, that summer. So that was the year after the London riots. And honestly, I was fascinated by the kind of impacts that the um, solicitor I was shadowing was having on the community. He knew everyone by name and there was no judgment because as I'm sure you're aware, like a lot of um, young people were involved in some of the riots and um, there were underlying tones of of, um, race as well, but also societal issues. And it was 
it was something which I found really opened my eyes. And I was like, I've got all these skills that align with the solicitor. I've seen in action this solicitor making a difference. I think that this is something I want to do. So I remember it was now getting to 16, the age you asked about. I wrote my first ever CV and it was like four pages long. It was ridiculously long. I didn't was have it. that good? You had a four page CV <laughs> 16. How are you that good? That's but, <laughs> that's because I put everything and anything in there from primary school and the holiday friends, um, exam, everything. I thought that's what CV was. So it was then once I shared it with my teacher and they were like, actually, this isn't quite what a CV should be like, that I was able to get some um, more clear guidance about what would be required for me to actually pursue a career in law. So I'd say that's where it started, that work experience, um, and then creating that CV. And then after that, I was on that path, trying to meet as many solicitors as I could get myself in that corporate world and improve my commercial awareness. Yeah, but it's two things that I'm going to kind of focus on. One, the London riots. I remember those. Well, they happened yeah. the day we got married. And, um, oh, wow. Sorry and, about and we got to the hotel the next day um mm-hmm. you go on honeymoon everything's great and fine we put the tv on as you do when you get in the hotel like, what yeah. this and um couldn't fathom it you know this fantasy world we'd been in and then mm-hmm. the reality of that was happening while we were doing that you know and, and yeah. i was teaching at the time and i remember going back to work afterwards a couple of weeks later and it was starting to happen a bit in birmingham and there was that real sense of change or these things that had always been there was suddenly on mainstream news and, and a lot of people who were already involved in it were like well yeah this has been going on for years you know this, this is not just some random sunday night or something you know this yeah. is this is a, a big deal um and then the last thing you say there so you're starting to network and talk to people and you're getting kind of these role models come through um yeah. So, I mean, did you have the confidence to do that then when you say 17, 18, that kind of age? Is this something that you just, I wanted to speak to people, so I spoke to people? Because yeah. that, that's not easy for everyone, surely. I know, and it wasn't easy for me. Uh, as I said, I felt a lot of pressure being the oldest sibling and also seeing the kind of character my dad was. He was someone that could get along with everyone. Uh, he always liked, liked to joke. Like he, he was good at being, at having quite a presence. So I felt as if, if he could do it, then why couldn't I? And that was something which I carried through probably still today that they're only people, even if they are solicitor, barrister, a judge, a carpenter, accountant, like they're, they're just people. <laughs> they've got families, they've got interests, they work, they pay bills, they eat food. And reminding myself of that helped me be less intimidated by them. And then by doing that, I was able to um, find other people like me. So like something which I still do today is whenever I attend events, I always make sure that I task myself with asking a question. And that does two things. One being it forces me to listen that much more attentively because you can't ask a good question if you're not listening to what people are saying. And two, it helps with my public speaking and confidence because especially when you're in a room with say, five, 10, 30, 50 people who are strangers to you and you're raising your hand to ask a question and you're trying to articulate it and you don't want to sound silly. Um, it's really helped me develop my own like, um, self-esteem and, and my confidence. So I would say it was something that was scary, but just adjusting the voice in my head and then forcefully putting myself in positions where I would be outside of my comfort zone. It really helped me get a lot better at it. Uh, and asking questions at events is an important mm. factor as well. I know it's always said that you always ask questions in job interviews, but yeah. I think at events where you've been listening to people because you also don't want to ask the question that's already been answered. You, you know, yep. you're not doing yeah. it just for the sake of it. Like, look at me, I'm asking. Yeah. It's got to be, like you said, articulated well and intelligent and relevant mm. to the conversation. It will help get you remembered as well. And I presume that's probably happening. That, were, that was a great question we must catch up afterwards little things like that start to add little up things like that it really does make all the difference like I remember being told while getting better at networking start with your name end with your name hi my name's Marvin it was lovely to meet you I'm Marvin things like that just saying it twice 
can help people remember who you are. And as you said, asking questions. So there are ways to to do it, but I'd say the hardest part is starting it off. Um, but yeah, can can be intimidating, but it gets easier in time. Yeah, I mean, if you enjoyed the that kind of networking and those kind of things, did you ever consider going into maybe sales, business development, public speaking, yeah. teaching, or anything like? Were those ever on your radar that maybe that's a skill set, or you're looking to develop it, or was it still at this point, kind of eighteen, nineteen, going into twenty, you still thinking law? <laughs> so um, it, it's interesting you say that because I was aware of sales roles i must admit at that point i did not know business development was a, a term that was used um but I, I did think that was probably something that i could do but i wouldn't have known what industry to do that in and that's the thing like coming up to those ages 18 19 now being at university and studying law i was realizing that the part of my course that i was enjoying wasn't raw law like it wasn't the traditional equity and trust or land law contract law subjects it was the legal philosophy it was the international relations um it was law and technology and it was that aspect of my character which i was really able to explore through um studying at university but also just widening that network so those same networking skills i'd use when i'd put on my suit and tie as a small 16 year old now I'm 18 19 I'm a bit more casual because I'm a uni student and probably thinking about the next meal <laughs> and um, I'm able to just make friends with people that are like-minded which is really really important so like one person I know is how we know each other is, is Paul and um, then again like through Paul I was able to meet other people such as um, um, Kamani and it's like when you've got a group of people around you that are like-minded it can really help you challenge the ideas you have of yourself so despite me thinking I'm this big bad lawyer <laughs> um, thinking of like Harvey Specter from Suits for example that that show I, I was able to realize that actually it's okay for me to be a bit softer for me to to care for me to engage in let's say a bit more like consultancy work to care about issues such as sustainability and it was at that point where I was um, experimenting with my diet for example thinking how can I have a more sustainable diet and improve my, my lifestyle so um, that I would say was the point at which I was like actually I've been pursuing this career in law for a few years now throughout some of my teens is this really what I want to do. Yeah. Was it a conscious decision to surround yourself with people like you or with or with certain traits? I know as, as a teacher, I've I've done the whole, if you sit by that person, they're going to drag you down and you need to hang out with these people. And, you know, oh, I mean, you look back and go, what was I doing telling a 16 year old who to sit by? Um, <laughs> you know, but it, it is important who you hang out with. You know, I, I still see a very small group of school friends. You think about all the people you've encountered in your life. And then your mm -hmm. circle friend becomes smaller and smaller. Or well, mine does. It really does. Um, so, I mean, was it a conscious decision that I'm going to uni, I'm going to surround myself with people who are confident, who are this, who are that? Or does it just naturally happen? I would say, in my case, anyway, it did happen naturally. So, um, Paul, for example, was someone that was in front of me at the time. I said, I have come from South London to Southampton, where I went to uni. I don't know anyone here. <laughs> this guy pulls in front of me. Let me say hello. And the thing is that I'm using that as an example, but I did that with many other people. But like the, the effort you put into those friendships, into those connections is something that will come as time goes on. You start realizing, oh, you've got similar interests. You've got similar ambitions, similar values. And I feel like it, is, it isn't really something that can be um too calculated and it's really like something which you you have to put yourself out there and then then you see what sticks um because it's very easy to like miss opportunities for example and and when you've got a strong network of like-minded people they can also bring opportunities to you like I know some of my friends were able to while I was looking for a new job um, more recently, these past few years, they were able to put me in touch with people that could help with my CV, that could lead to um, an interview. And it's, it's something which you get better at in time because, as I said, during those teenage years entering my 20s, I was discovering sides to myself that I had not explored while I was at school. 
And being away from home, I feel like really helped me do that because starting off this conversation, talking about my siblings, my parents, and honestly, I, I wanna make it clear that I love them to pieces. <laughs> they are a huge reason I am the person I am, but being away from that and then traveling, doing a year abroad in Canada, it was like, I had opportunities to, to redefine myself, to surround myself with people that I wouldn't normally do so. And the, the fact of the matter is not everyone you meet is going to be in your life forever. But that's okay. The the point which I would like suggest to others is to you don't know until you do it. So um, that was something which I always carried through, and I still do now. Um, which I'm sure you'll you'll ask later. But considering my my career and my journey, like going outside of my comfort zone, meeting people that maybe in the past I wouldn't have connected with, or we don't immediately have similar interests. So. Um, yeah, something that that gets more fun as you get older. Yeah, that's that's an interesting take on it. But yeah, you can't mm. always calculate. But I want certain friends who do certain things. Yeah. Um, things just happen, or they don't, and then you mm. kind of go with the flow, don't you? Um, now let, let's get to a little, maybe an awkward bit here. So, Marvin, you are not a lawyer, and no. <laughs> uh, I hope you don't mind me saying that. So, I guess there's two ways you can look at this question. Um, you could either ask what went wrong. Or what went right? So uh, I'll let you answer that how you how you want. But um, so what what are you doing now? How did we go from studying law, all those kind of things, and uh, to, to what you do now? Whatever it is that you do now, we I don't think we still know yet. <laughs> well, let me start there with what I do now, and then I'll work my way backwards. So right now, I'm what's called a customer success manager, and just like the term business development, a few years ago, didn't even know what that meant, <laughs> but it is like uh, an account manager um, with a bit of sales. So my role day to day is to communicate with our existing clients, ensure that they are looked after and ensure that those customers succeed in terms of their partnership with the startup I'm working at called Native. And um, what Native does, just for the the quick pitch, (laughs) is, um, yeah, we are a startup. We've been running for a few years. And we aim to engage university students with their student unions. And um, we do that primarily through events. So yes, some of it will be the club nights, lots of music and and dancing. But I'd say where we add a lot of value is um, the enriching activities, such as having um, people like George the Poet come on board for Black History Month or like Tyler the Creator for a music event or like working with with Converse on um, creativity or having uh, Matt Crape from Dragon's Den and helping with like entrepreneurship and um, I would say to answer your question in terms of what went right or what went wrong it was definitely a bit of both so now taking it back to uni what was going wrong (laughs) was that I was struggling to relate to the law modules I was doing. And I say that because I just wasn't really enjoying it. Um, I didn't really care about contract law or equity and trust. And and it was disheartening for me because as I said, for years I'd worked towards getting to that seat in that lecture hall to smile at the end, get that degree and become a solicitor. And I was, day by day, lecture by lecture, essay by essay, realizing that wouldn't make me happy. And um, I'd say what went right was that doing the legal philosophy, doing the law and technology modules really excited me. And alongside all of um, my experiences in terms of my career, it was me trying to um, bolster my CV by doing things like um, volunteering with uh, youth organizations and also having paid jobs over summer and it wasn't until I'd reached that point where I was like I'm at uni I'm not enjoying all of it what's going wrong that I was able to reflect and be like okay so I don't I know I don't care about that so what do I care about and that's when I was able to look at the things which I thought I was just doing in order to show I was well-rounded but it was actually there was like a trend there it was young people it was technology and I loved it like whenever I was able to be in a room talk about technology or talk about young people or ideally both 
that's what interested me. I was reading books and it was about those topics. I was listening to podcasts. It was about those topics. My most memorable conversations were about those topics. And that's why now working in the um, events and technology space at Native, uh, I feel really fulfilled because I'm giving back and it's about topics that I care about. So um, I would say that it was it was hard. <laughs> it wasn't always easy grinding through doing work that I wasn't always enjoying, but it was using my own personal time to really discover what I did care about, what I did love. And that was how I was able to firstly work in HR technology and then pivot towards education technology at the moment um, here at Native. Yeah. Did, did you stick around and finish your degree? I did, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. Are you are you glad you did that? Looking back, are you glad I am. you just took it out, or do you think oh, I should have left earlier and got a head start? <laughs> um, honestly, I am because I was having a bit of a quarter life crisis um, during my degree. So it, I, I reckon personally, it could have been harmful for me to leave because there wasn't anything I was going towards. Yes. So despite that struggle and the difficulties I was having, it was. I was able to learn about myself through doing that. And, and the thing about life is things don't always work out as you'd like. And that was a good time for me to realize that because when you break it down, it's me writing an essay. So yes, it's not the most exciting topic in the world, but essays are things which can be, like they're transferable skills. So thinking about things like that, it's like, this is important for me to know because I need to know how to form an argument, how to defend it, how to rebut a counter argument, how to give both sides of an opinion. And I definitely wouldn't say that I wasted my time at all. Like, I'm actually really happy that I finished it. And as I said, it was through doing it that I was able to discover what I love and, and care about. And I remember um, working with Teach First for a, for a period, like I thought, okay, maybe I want to be a teacher. That was the connection to, to young people. And then I was like, maybe actually I want to be a technology consultant. Or um, it, it was while studying at uni that I was able to, to do those things. So um, I, did, I did finish it. Uh, I felt like that was a personal achievement for myself. And I was able to pull the grades up once I changed that mindset. Um, and um, now I'm at a job where I'm, where I'm really happy. Uh, there's a few times you've mentioned happiness as being important yeah. and that's really <laughs> nice to hear because that's not I think it's it's almost seen as a bit I don't I don't know if cliche is the right word I think I overuse the word cliche ironically um, <laughs> but you know the importance of being happy and it's mm. there's not much of that around at the moment yeah. um, it doesn't get talked about as being it, I, I feel anyway certainly with young people it doesn't get talked about as much as mm. an important part of the job you're going to choose, of a career you're going to choose. I think it is there, but I think there's still a, oh, money, cars, houses and things. And hey, yeah. you know, when you're 15, 16, uh, that guess, I guess yeah. that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? You know, that's all you know, yeah. and it's what you see on your social medias and things. Um, but you mentioned volunteering a couple of times as well, and, you, and you're talking about that you have done it and you do do it. Um, so I'm going to kind of ask you all the volunteering questions in one go. So, I mean, what have you done? What are you doing how has it shaped you? Why should people do it? You know, all these kind of questions in one go, yeah. Marvin. What, what you got about volunteering? Got it. All right. I think I've got go. one of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I first started volunteering when I was 17, I'd say. So I had a mentor through the Amos bursary, and she suggested, Marvin, go for this. And I remember that the minimum age required was 18. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm only 17, I, like Jasmine, I, I can't do it. And she was like, Marvin, I'm going to teach you an important lesson in life. <laughs> <laughs> You're rarely qualified for the things you should be doing. And it's through doing things outside of your comfort zone, things you've never done before, pushing the boundaries a little bit, that's where you really grow and learn. And I've taken that throughout my life. I've been applying for roles and not all the way qualified for what I've been volunteering myself for projects I probably don't have all the experience for but it has really helped me and sometimes it's worked out brilliantly other times lots and lots of lessons learned but it is important in terms of um just getting better 
and that can be in a personal capacity, professional capacity. And that's something which I didn't know at the time, but that's what volunteering was doing for me. So I started off volunteering with a charity called Street Games and um, worked my way up. So despite being 17, by the time I was 18, I was a, a youth leader and I was actually able to get my sister on board and we had a, a whale of a time. And what Street Games does is they bring doorstep sport to um, young people from um, less advantageous socioeconomic backgrounds. So did that for a few years. And then other times I've volunteered was when I started off tutoring, I would just do it for um, children of my like, mom or dad's friends. And it was something I enjoyed because as I said, I did have a little stint where I thought Marvin is going to be a teacher. <laughs> and, um, and that was something which I really, really benefited from. Like it helped me discover that yes, teaching isn't for me, but if I could work with young people, that is something which I feel like could be for me. And um, then I was uh, now moving on to a youth centre and I'm giving back because I feel like something which is really lacking in um, academia is that education on employability and particularly soft skills. Yeah. So all the things which I was saying at the start of this conversation that public speaking, the, the networking, communication, these are things which I feel like unless you're going above and beyond or you're doing extracurricular activities, you're probably going to miss out on developing those things and you won't realise the advantages you get from refining those skills because it's an unknown unknown. And um, I figure that's some, some way I would love to, to give back. So as much as it did help me with my CVs, it became a talking point in some of my interviews for work experience, internships, even, even my job. Um, it's also part of my story in terms of discovering why I'm a law student that isn't practicing law. So I would definitely recommend for, for others to take on volunteering, like do something that is of meaning to you and you would really see the value in it because through volunteering with street games, that's how I was able to get my first like part-time job um, during the summers in between uni working as a youth mentor for NCS The Challenge and without that little pocket money I was making I don't know how I would have survived uni so <laughs> there are a lot of like unforeseeable benefits to doing it so um, it's definitely something that I'd recommend as as often as I can because as I said with the street games I was able to progress and become a youth leader and those leadership skills were things I was able to then use in terms of my application to be president of the Upreach Society at university. And then I could use that as a talking point to get my grad job. So um, there are a lot of links which you will only see in hindsight, but it is really about building that, that personal brand and discovering what's of interest to you. Because yeah. one thing which is kind of strange is when you're 15, 16, they tell you to pick what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And the fact of the matter is we will we will change, we will acquire new interests, we will probably lose interest in some things, our friendship groups will change, our experiences, that life happens. So if you've got more experiences to draw upon um, and they don't always have to be paid, which is why volunteering is, is so amazing, I would, I would definitely um, recommend it because I know it's added a lot of value to my life. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, and organisations are still crying out for volunteers, aren't they? You, you know, with with the last couple of years, what's happened to organisations and charities and community groups? I think there's also the perception I can only ever volunteer for the big charities, but there's a there's a thousand community groups. A quick Facebook search brings up more than you'll ever Honestly. be able to attend. Uh, and if as a young person, you go there and say, "I want to help out," that they'll bite your hands yeah. off. You know, you, you'll be in there forever. But, yeah. But there's, there's so much potential uh, and to be able to say I can't find a place, that's obviously not the reason why you're not volunteering, is it? You know, because there's yeah. always somebody looking for a little bit of help. So uh, that's, that's yeah. a great message. Thank you. So what's next for you? I mean, where, where do you go next? I mean, you don't have to say too much because I don't want to get you in trouble with your current employer. But, you know, what, what's, <laughs> next, what's next for uh, for Marvin? Where's he going next? Um, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a, a fun question to answer. Yeah. So. I am currently in a client-facing role as a customer success manager, working in the 
technology in, in youth space. And one thing which I'm trying to do for myself is learn how to code. And reason being is because Python is the coding language which I identified is the one that is probably most relevant to um, AI and ethics. So that specifically is the branch of technology that I found fascinating, as I said, that legal philosophy, technology, for me, it landed in AI and ethics. So I'm not sure if that means a, a job or if that means maybe pivoting slightly into a more consulting products technology type role at Native, but that is something which I'm doing currently. And then personally, as an extracurricular, um, tutoring, so um, doing that, as well as also um, volunteering at my local youth organization. So I am constantly putting myself out there, discovering more about myself, trying to give back. And that I would say is what is next for Mark. You are going to be a busy person. I love it. Like, you know, <laughs> the, the, again, the, the impact you're having on your local community, the, the, the yeah. people who, who might 30, 40 years from now go, remember that guy Marvin who came in and helped out? <laughs> yeah, you remember he said that thing? And you, you might really be able to have that impact on people. And it's, and it's fascinating to hear your interest in AI and ethics because obviously that's a hot topic. Um, it has been for quite a few years now. And obviously the big players like your Elon Musks and we only ever hear about what the big businesses are doing. And of course. Mark Zuckerberg and all those kind of things. Um, here's a random question I, I was going to save till after I'd stopped recording, but I'm going to ask it while we're on tape. tape. How old am I? Good grief. While we're on uh, whatever this is called. So, um, I mean, what, what's your take on AI and ethics? Is it something that you're terrified of and you want to make things better? Do you see a ton of potential? Is there too much power with, with the, the big, you know, the big guys in charge in America? Or, I mean, what, what's the feel of somebody who's really passionate about it like yourself? That's a, yeah, I would say it is potentially scary, but I feel like that provides a lot of opportunity for us to get it right. And it will require experimentation. It will require testing. But I feel like what is really important is for us while we are developing these technologies and um, machine learning techniques is to consider that because we are rebuilding intelligence, um, when you think of... Um, the closest thing we've got to that, which is human intelligence. You teach children as they're growing up about things such as morals, things such as empathy. And it is these softer skills that these intangibles, these things that are harder to convert into zeros and ones that I think can really elevate the growth at which we will see AI um, impact in our lives. And, and that for me is why the the ethical element is something that's so important to me. So like um, solving solutions, like let's say without being morbid, but like curing cancer, mm -hmm. it would be very logical to give it to everyone and then test a million different um, remedies. Mm -hmm. But that wouldn't be very ethical. And it's, it's addressing questions like that, which I think um, will really help us and, and I'd say another thing is the diversity of data. Mm -hmm. So um, using things like uh, Amazon Echo or any of the Internet of Things, uh, people have accents. Not everyone speaks English as a first language. And even uh, medical data, like I remember giving blood in, in 2019 and then discovering that there was a, a deficit in um, insights that they had into um, blood from ethnic minorities purely because they didn't have that diversity of data. So I think it is a combination of rethinking what intelligence means and looking at ourselves because we are the, the models, um, which does tie into to the youth and into children, to, to babies, to child development, but also remembering that this technology isn't just going to be for the West. It isn't just going to be for the first world countries that like we've got billions and billions of people on this planet that we need to do our best to look after. And the only way to do that is to get them involved in the decisions we're making and the technologies that we are building. So that's where I would love to discuss and add value. I would just love to develop a few coding skills so that I can talk with a bit more confidence on the matter. Mm, right, you do talk with confidence, trust me. <laughs> and, and it's great that there's people 
like yourself who who have got this optimism and ideas of where it can be and where it can go. Yeah. Um, and I think we do get bogged down. Guilty as charged here that you only hear there's a couple of people in the world doing it. And unless yeah. it's Google doing it, it doesn't really matter because they're the only important ones. And what, what can Apple yeah. Siri do? But these are the only ways that, you know, AI yeah. is coming about. But there's a lot more to it. And uh, I think the next decade or so from what I read is really, really exciting. Uh, can be a bit terrifying. But re- really yeah. exciting about the potential of, of what we can achieve. Um, so nice one for being at the forefront of that. that that's really exciting. <laughs> for you. That's, uh, Not yet. I'm, I'm working it. Oh, you will be. You will be. I'll be able to say I know that guy. Yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah. that's it. That's it. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going to ask you one last question, which I haven't prepped you for, but you might know it's coming anyway. So if um, if you could go back, Marvin, back to like 16, 17 year old you, give yourself a bit of advice that you wish uh, you'd listened to or taken on board or you wish somebody had given you and you thought, I'm going to stick with that. Um, mm-hmm. What would it be? I would say you don't have to make up your mind now. And the reason I say that is because I feel as if I probably would have had different experiences, opened myself up to different opportunities if I wasn't so driven on law, 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 law. Um, So you're only 15, 16. You're going to be alive for a long, long time. You're going to be working a nine to five for many, many years before you eventually retire take time to get it right um that would be the advice i'd, I'd give myself love it thank you and thank you for everything on, on this chat it's been absolutely mm-hmm. fascinating it's uh the, the journey that you've been on and the enthusiasm you still have for what you do and that you, you haven't been seen as okay yeah all right at one point it was going to be this and now it's this and now it's this and uh, <laughs> AI probably wasn't even in the forefront of anybody's mind when you were doing your options in year nine you know so if you'd said to a teacher I want to do AI and ethics you know when you're in uh, when you're 14 years old I'm sure you would have been laughed out of school <laughs> and now look but, but it's not only a viable job but also a crucial one uh, on a variety of levels so thank you so much for sharing all your a- ideas and expertise it's really no appreciated pleasure. Um, stay on the line for a second or two afterwards we'll say a proper cheerio there but for now I'll just say thank you so much for talking business really appreciate it and uh, see you again in the cheerio definitely thanks bye See, told you that was going to be inspirational and motivational. Marvin, thank you so much for your honesty and for sharing your ideas and your expertise. Absolutely fascinating from start to finish. Really appreciate it. And for everybody watching and listening, appreciate you as well. Thank you for liking, sharing, rating, reviewing and subscribing. Please do continue to do it because it all helps more people to find the podcast. So thank you very much. And until next time on Talking Business, I'll just say cheerio.